Let's do an experiment. I need everyone to stand up. Everyone, everyone, we got this. Let's get this going. Okay, now fill in the gaps so we're shoulder to shoulder. All right? Shoulder to shoulder. All right. Let's do this. I need people, I need everyone to turn to the person to your left and give them a high five. <laughs> and don't forget the person on the other side. Their left, your right. <laughs> awesome. Okay, now let's set things up. I need you to turn to the person in front of you and give them a fist pound. <laughs> Let me hear the explosions. <laughs> awesome. Now, if you really want to step it up, I need you to turn to the person to your right and give them a nice hug. Mm. Come on, everyone needs a hug. <laughs> OK, now eyes up here, eyes up here. If you really want to step it up, take off your, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, that experiment was to show the power of the human connection. Meeting new people, connecting with strangers. Isn't it amazing? It's why I decided to travel to every country in the world in the last six years, to see if I could get that feeling everywhere I went. And the answer is yes, I did. Sure, the music, the food, the tradition, the culture, these are all interesting and, and delightful things to learn about, but it's witnessing the human connection and taking part in it. That was the most rewarding experience. Now, I visited 193 UN nations in the last 72 months, graduating with what I call a global degree. I'm age 30 now and a dual citizen, making me the youngest Canadian and youngest American man to do it. But every time I tell this to someone, I get asked the same four questions everywhere I go. I'm sure many of you have the same questions in your head. But instead of giving some boring, traditional answers, I thought for this TED Talk, I'd give some new, unconventional ones. So here we go. Question number one, what is your job? How do you afford this? Typically, I'll explain to people I'm a content creator who gets paid to take videos and photos for companies, or that I, I'll be a consultant for brands or invest in stocks from my laptop. Some call it being a digital nomad. But one time at a dinner in Zambia, I, uh, I was called a world traveling entrepreneur. And an old retired man at the end of the table put down his fork and knife, leaned back, looked me square in the eyes and said, World traveling entrepreneur, huh? So you're homeless and unemployed. <laughs> I actually quite like that. So the next time someone asks my job, I'm just going to tell them that. Next question. What is your favorite country? <sighs> my favorite question. You know, there's no good answer to this question. It really depends on the people you're with and the things you're doing. Each country is totally unique. But I thought I'd share a few crazy photos just to give you an idea. <laughs> Be careful in China, and make sure you eat it before it eats you. And why brush your hair when you can hang out with Einstein in Sri Lanka? <laughs> Identify with El Dorado, the alpaca in Luxembourg. You never know, you may find an octopus on your head at the Parthenon, or a Mongolian vulture on your shoulder, or a Gambian snake on your face. Don't forget to write your mom while in Switzerland and then fly in to deliver it yourself. Or better yet, Skype with your grandma while skydiving in Australia. <laughs> and why take a selfie when you just jump in photos with others, like these Harajuku girls from Tokyo? Or these Indonesian kids? Or these Egyptians? Or this Muslim lady from Brunei? Or this Saudi Arabian woman from Georgia? And last but not least, just know if all else fails in life, you can always join a tribe in Fiji. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Well, despite a few friends having some hairy, scary moments, nothing bad has ever actually ever happened to me. In fact, the worst thing that ever happened was one time on a layover in Chicago, I got my wallet stolen at a coffee shop. That's right, travels every country in the world safely, gets robbed in America. Oh, the irony. It makes six years of travel worth it just for that one punchline. And last but not least, what did you learn? Well, I learned people are good everywhere. 
No matter what corner of the earth you travel to, you're going to be met with kindness, generosity, respect, and love. I stand in front of all of you today with a smile on my face, and I can say people are inherently good everywhere. And last but not least, I learned I'm extremely privileged, not just as a tall, white male coming from a loving, middle-class family, but as a holder of these, a US or Canadian passport. It just allows me to walk into 183 countries in the world without visa, and this is extremely rare. Many of you in the audience with a UK passport have the same privilege, or at least you did two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's as if the world were a rock concert. Having one of these is like a VIP all-access pass, while many others are standing at the back of a 7.7 .7 billion person line. To give you a visual representation, here's a map showing visa requirements for Singaporean citizens who can just walk into 190 countries in the world. The different shades of green representing visa-free, visa upon arrival, or electronic visa available. And the gray countries are the ones that require visa. And see that tiny little dot in Central Asia? That's Singapore, tiny country. Now let's compare with a much larger country like Iraq and see the visa requirements for them. They, have, see, they can only visit 27 countries in the world without visa. Quite a difference, right? Makes it hard for people like Badr Khan, a friend of mine who's a popular content creator, and he had to pay an additional $10,000 after being deported three times for having an Iraqi passport. Badr Khan's world is defined by his passport. Another example is Thailand. They receive 35 million tourists every year, making them the sixth most visited country in the world, above the UK, might I add. Yet a Thai citizen can only visit 77 countries in the world, giving them a very weak passport. Makes it hard for my people like Petty, a friend of mine who worked for a Canadian travel company for the last 10 years. He got invited to the anniversary in Panama and got an all-inclusive, all-expenses paid trip to come and join. Unfortunately, Petty got denied access to his visa and was the only employee who couldn't attend the event. Petty's world is defined by his passport. And now you may ask yourself, how hard is it to get a visa? You just fill out some paperwork, take a photo, pay a fee, and you're good to go. Well, that's just not true. Getting visas to some of these countries was one of the greatest challenges of my life. And still, there's an additional bias. If you're from North America, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, or Singapore, you're statistically more likely to get approved for your visa. Meanwhile, someone from Pakistan with the same college education, financial situation, age, marital status, you'll likely get denied. Makes it hard for people like Bhatt Asma Ali, who got enrolled into a Singapore university and received a full ride, three year scholarship. Unfortunately, she didn't get her visa and she had to turn down the offer for formally holding a Pakistani passport. Miss Ali's world is defined by her passport. So these examples show it doesn't really matter how much money you have, how hard you work, or how intelligent you are. The true deciding factor is what soil you're born on. So how is it the new decade and this is still the case? Where did this geographic lottery come from? Was it always this way? Well, not exactly. Throughout history, a few key inventions have impacted our societies. And these inventions didn't just come from one country, but from all over the world. Here's a few examples going back to the 8th century. Fatima al-Firi founded the first university in Fez, Morocco. She was originally from Tunisia. Ahmed Touloun created the first hospital in Cairo, Egypt. He was originally from Iraq. Mohammed al-Khwarizmi created algebra, which is what we use in computer science today. In fact, his nickname, al-Khwarizmi, is where we get the word algorithm. He was originally from Uzbekistan. We know the name Nikola Tesla, pioneer of the AC electric system. He was from a particular region in Serbia, which is now modern-day Croatia. And lastly, Jacob W. Davis partnered with Levi Strauss from Germany to create the first blue jeans. He is originally from Latvia. So the places we go to learn and to heal 
the numbers we use, the lights we turn on, and the clothes we wear come from innovators throughout Africa, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. So how strong are these passports today? Not at all. In fact, some of them have gotten weaker over time. Imagine Nikola Tesla, alive and well today, and unable to go to San Francisco to see his cars driving everywhere. He can't even meet Elon. And speaking of Elon Musk, that brings us to modern day minds and just how close we came to not having them. Elon Musk, investor in Tesla and founder of SpaceX, he was actually born in South Africa, who has one of the weakest passports in the world. Luckily for him, his mother, May Musk, was born in Saskatchewan, Canada, allowing Elon to study in Canada and later immigrate to the US. We all know Steve Jobs, co-founder of Apple, but what many of us may not know is his biological father, Abdul Fattah Jandali, was born in Syria. He actually came to the US to pursue a PhD at the University of Wisconsin, where he later had Steve. Now you gotta ask yourself, would Abdul be allowed to pursue the same PhD today, or is, would he be rejected? seen as potentially another Syrian refugee. Sergey Brin, co-founder in Google, he was actually born in Russia, but he had to escape. Um, he, he comes from a Jewish family and had to escape persecution in 1979. Ask yourself, would a young, bright, talented Sergey from Russia be allowed to come to the US today? Or is there a chance he could be rejected, seen as a potential threat or a hacker? So the cars we drive, the websites we use, and the devices we use them on can actually all be traced back to our immigration and visa policies. It makes us appreciate how lucky we are to have these inventions, but can't help but ask ourselves how many creations have been lost? How many great minds have been denied at the border? And now you may say, well, we have the internet. You can just simply go online, share your ideas, and connect with people from there. Well, I ask why CEOs still travel across the world for face-to-face -face meetings. Why people pay thousands of dollars to attend a TED talk when they can just watch it for free online afterwards? Or why people travel in the first place? It goes back to the human connection, that feeling of giving a high five to the person to your left and a fist bound to the person in front of you. Imagine rece receiving these emojis from just some random stranger, followed by the words, I love you. <laughs> that person would likely get blocked. <laughs> it's just not the same. The offline human experience is what propels ideas, relationships, and momentum. So then why do visas exist? Well, the first reason is safety. So let's look at safety, and why don't we start by looking at the number one safest country in the world, Iceland. Their citizens can walk into 180 countries, giving them a very strong passport. But what many may not know is Iceland has opened up their doors to 174 countries who can uh, receive a visa upon arrival or don't need a visa at all almost a one-to-one -one ratio. This is through a phenomenon called reciprocity, the idea that if you open up your borders to us, we'll open up our, our borders. Other countries like Rwanda, Qatar, and Botswana have adopted similar policies and now rank among the safest countries in the world. So reciprocity and safety can be linked. The second main reason is to prevent illegal immigration. And though it's true, having visas may deter or will deter unwelcome visitors, you're also deterring the welcome ones. You're alienating the illegal aliens, but what about the millions of tourists and, visas and travelers who just want to explore your country? Well, the fact is we are the most well-traveled humans in history. And to give you an idea of this magnitude, World Tourism Organization released that 1.45 billion tourists traveled in 2019, fueling $8.8 trillion industry, which is now the third largest in the world and creating 319 million new jobs. But there's a problem. A research paper from the London School of Economics has revealed that visa restrictions on average reduce the flow of travelers between 52 and 63%, meaning countries that require visas are missing out on one half to two thirds of these numbers. So it's ironic that these visas are designed to protect the jobs of their citizens when really just opening up doors would only create new ones. Countries like Saudi Arabia have realized this. Uh, very hard to get into and, and extremely conservative. They've now opened up to 49 countries in 2019. And they've received 40 million new tourists, $25 billion in tourism, and they just announced that they expect 10% uh, of their GDP 
to come from tourism and create one million new jobs by the year 2030. Which leads me to the third reason I believe visas exist, which is the nation's history itself. Old political rivalries, conflicts, colonizations. I tend to avoid politics while in these countries, but I can't help but ask myself, is a child born to hold a grudge against a neighboring region, resent those within a particular country or a specific nation? Or is this something passed down to them, taught to them the same way they learn to read or write? Which leads me to one final question for all of you today. Can we afford it? History has shown us that the flow of people and ideas is what creates prosperity. As we're currently facing an environmental crisis, can we afford for innovators to be denied at the border? As we deal with things like Islamophobia, can we, deal, can we have these visas act as virtual walls, locking the world from seeing each other? As we're seeing these political divisions rise, can we afford to ignore reciprocity and all of its benefits? Can we afford for your world to be defined by your passport? Or should it be defined by you? Or do we need a world unbound, allowing those with the financial means and the ability, the chance to travel, to be here today? The chance to give a high five to the person to their left, a fist pound to the person in front of them, a hug and a kiss, and hear the words, I love you. To all the people who I've met on this journey who wanted to be here today but couldn't because they couldn't receive a visa, I want you to know that I miss you and I love you. I wish you were here. And uh, I'd give you the biggest hug, and the kiss in, in, biggest hug and kiss in the world if you were here right now. Thank you very much.